Good morning, happy Tuesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand, and it is perfect as usual. So I'm cleaning out old emails. Came across one in the Q&A that I totally spaced the first time through. So I apologize. I'm gonna to apologize to Matt. Matt had a question about knee valgus. And, and so I, I, I wanted to talk about this because it, there's a lot of details that I think that get either misunderstood or glossed over or looking at the relationships. And so we're gonna kind of take this apart just a little bit. So Matt says, I know you have to work on knee valgus in athletes. And he wants to know to what degree is it not something to worry about because it potentially helps produce power. Um, I'm wondering where I could find more info. So here's your info. So let's talk about, about what this is. So, so knee valgus is, is this thing that some people refer to as knock knees, or they'll say it's a frontal plane position of the knee. So it's, it's, it looks like it's in the imaginary frontal plane, but it's really not. It's actually a twist in the knee. So if I grab my knee real quick. So what we're talking about is that twist right there. So we got a femur that's that would be relatively internally rotated and a tibia that's relatively externally rotated. So I got that, and so we got a little bit of, a, of an angle that gets produced there, and like I said, people think it's in the imaginary foam plane, but it's, it's all transverse plane. So it's a twist. Now, let's talk about why this occurs in the first place. So it is not, it is not tight adductors. Yes, the adductors are probably going to be active under these circumstances, but they're not tight. They're active for a reason. They're active by position. And so what we have to talk about now are some of the internal physics. So in most cases, I'm not going to say in every case, but in most cases, when you see a valgus knee, you're going to see a pelvis that's just a little bit wider than the thorax. And so what this does is it creates some internal forces that actually drive you harder into the ground. So, so your internal internal mass is actually accelerating at, at a higher, or it's not accelerating at a higher velocity, it's just moving at a higher velocity um, towards the ground. And so what this does is it shifts the center of mass of your body towards the medial aspect and forward. And so what this does is it then, it's gonna position the foot into a certain position so that so the calcaneus, so the sesentacum tali doesn't come back up as it as the foot tries to resupinate. So because it pushes you medially and forward, you end up with a foot that is in a later propulsive position from the get-go. So what this does is it lowers the arch, it accelerates the rate at which the tibia moves over the foot, and then you have an anterior orientation of the pelvis. Now if you have a wide infrasternal angle and you have this conical shape to, to your, your thorax relative to the pelvis, then you're also going to be standing in, in an antiverted position of the hip, which will actually uh, allow this to occur a little bit easier than if you were, say, a narrow. But the narrows will, will, will experience some valgus orientation as well. They tend to have it show up a little bit more towards the performance end of the spectrum versus just, just standing around. But the thing I want you to recognize is that under both circumstances, whether I'm landing a jump as a narrow and the knees come together, or as I'm standing, if I'm, if I'm a wide ISA, or if I'm a larger body size, and I'm standing in, in this valgus orientation, your center of mass is medial and forward. And what that does is it quickly maxes out how much dorsiflexion that you're actually gonna have. So you'll have overactivity of the, of the, the posterior compartment of the lower leg. It's gonna limit dorsiflexion, and then the, the valgus is going to occur under those circumstances. So, so this is a gravitational challenge all day, every day, through and through. It's a rotation that occurs and it's pushing you forward. So the, the goal of all rehab and training is to make sure that you can manage this, this, uh, this anteriorly driven or medially driven center of mass. So we gotta get you from this later propulsive type of a foot and later propulsive strategy, and we gotta move you back towards an early propulsion. So when we're talking about from a rehab standpoint, um, this is where we're gonna probably talk to somebody about, about some shoe orientation that's going to help position the foot into an earlier phase of propulsion. So if I have a calcaneus that's getting driven medially, um, then I need a, a, a shoe that's gonna help reorient the, the, the calcaneus, so give, give it some feedback. So this is where the heel counters and shoes 
make a difference. This is where a little bit of heel of elevation relative to the toe makes a huge difference because that's going to help the foot achieve its early propulsive position. So a running style shoe with a really rigid heel counter really, really comes into play here. Um, as far as activities are concerned, because gravity is not your friend under these circumstances, we're going to take gravity out of the equation at least initially. We're going to do a lot of sideline activities because chances are you've got an anterior and a posterior compression in the pelvis and in the thorax. If we lay on your side, we're going to get some of that AP expansion. And then we're going to move you towards inverted position. So if I'm a wide ISA, I'm going to be supine and inverted. If I'm a narrow ISA, I'm going to be prone and inverted. Um, if I have a larger body size or um, formerly pregnant females, um, they will have a yielding strategy in the pelvis, in the upper, especially the upper part of the pelvis. So under those circumstances, this is where SI belts come in really, really handy to help them learn how to manage and control that yielding strategy until they can have the, the, the muscle activity um, that, will, that will eventually assist them in, in control that. I'm going to work towards half kneeling, eventually towards split stance to gain the tibial control through uh, some of the posterior musculature like hamstrings. So hamstrings are like reins on a horse controlling the tibia. So when I can finally get you into those half kneeling or split stance positions, that's where we're going to gain a lot of that control. As we move out into the gym and we start talking about training strategies, these are where you're going to use unweighting strategies. So remember, this is a gravitational problem, right? So they're getting pushed down. Their internal physics are pushing them down. So we're going to use unweighting strategies like reverse band squats, um, jumps with, with, the, with the band to actually lighten them. Chopping activities um, will become more important than lifting activities. So when we're talking about like cable activities, so we're talking about cable chops because the cable chop actually unweights them as they're performing the, the, the trunk and hip activities. So those become much more valuable. Later on, once they learn how to control their center of mass more effectively, now we can move into, into uh, lifting activities and then progressive loading. So, so again, start with unloading strategies in the gym. If we're talking about box squatting, because I love box squatting under these circumstances, your narrow ISAs that are, that are uh, landing with the valgus orientations, you're going to start them with a high box position because they have to learn how to control their pelvic diaphragm because that's what's accelerating them um, towards the ground. With your wide ISA people, again, you're probably going to use some form of belting strategy. So even a weightlifting belt, SI belts, etc., to reduce the yielding strategy as they unload their weight onto the box. Because if they're a wide ISA, we've got to get the eccentric orientation of that pelvic diaphragm back, but we don't want the pelvis to yield. So we have to create this, this external compressive force to help them manage that. Once again, we're going to try to move them towards half kneeling and split stance activities so they learn how to control the foot position and then knee position. So we've got a lot of influences here when we're talking about, about knee valgus, but understand what it is. It's, it's a gravitational problem that's associated with the idiosyncratic physics of the individual. So it's not about tight muscles. It's not necessarily about weakness. It's literally about controlling the center of mass and the position. So Matt, I hope that gives you a, a little taste of, of, of what you're up against when you're talking about dealing with knee valgus. If you have any more questions or concerns, please let me know. Go to askbillhartman at gmail.com and we'll try to get your question on here and I'll see you guys tomorrow.